the, the title of the message today is, Is It All Worthless? Is It All Worthless? Romans 4.25 says, He was delivered up for our trespasses and raised for our justification. And then if we look at wherever my uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, I'm just going to read a big block here. Uh, we're going to start in verse 12. 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 12. And it says, Now if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say there is no resurrection of the dead? If there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our proclamation is in vain. Oh, I just lost my place. And so is your faith. If Christ has not been raised, then our proclamation is in vain, and so is your faith. Moreover, we are found to be false witnesses about God because we have testified wrongly about God that he raised up Christ, whom he did not raise up. If, in fact, the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is worthless. You are still in your sins. Those, then, who have fallen asleep in Christ have also perished. If we have put our hope in Christ, for this life only we should be pitied more than anyone. But, as it is, Christ has been raised from the dead. Can I get a hallelujah? Amen. Okay. That would be a bigger hallelujah kind of moment. I'm just saying. Like, But as it is, Christ has been raised from the dead. Hallelujah! Okay, so, Alright, so the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep, for since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead also comes through one man. If Christ is not raised from the dead, then our faith is worthless. So we should ask the question then. We should ask the question then. Did did the resurrection actually happen? So in the spirit of our doctrine series that we've been in the middle of, today will kind of be a little bit like a doctrine of the resurrection, sort of, kind of, you know? And because if the resurrection is true, that's going to that's gonna mean something, one way or the other. So there's some, there's some false views about the resurrection out there. Then I thought, let's go ahead and, and talk about a couple of false views. One is uh, the swoon theory. Has anybody ever heard of the swoon theory? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. So the swoon theory uh, posits that Jesus never actually died. That he, he just passed out. And then he came to again. Um, which, if you've ever read the Bible and read the story of the crucifixion, and all that Jesus endured, um, it's pretty silly, honestly, to believe the swoon theory. It is more miraculous, actually, that Jesus made it to the cross alive. Yeah. Yes. It, it would, I mean, I mean, it's ridiculous. If you, there's a couple of websites out there that you can, you can Google like a physicians, a physicians like summary of crucifixion. And uh, I thought about it, but I didn't want to gross everyone out. So um, it is indeed what Jesus endured for us. So there is some value in knowing it and reviewing it. But I also didn't feel like being gory for gory's sake. Um, so everybody said amen. Amen. Okay. So, <clears throat> so the swoon theory just says uh, Jesus didn't actually die. It's so ridiculous. We're not going to talk about that theory anymore. Okay. Because... The only reason Jesus made it to the cross alive is because he's God, and he said, nobody takes my life from me, I give my life up. So when Jesus was done, he gave up his spirit. So 
they, yeah, like basically it has been said that Jesus was so badly beaten before he got to the cross that he was barely recognizable as a human being, as a man. That's how badly he was beaten. So the amount of blood loss he was going through would have killed him far before he got to the cross. He had this divine nature sustaining him to get to the cross to finish the work that was done. He, he died, okay? The second one is the theft theory. And that is basically that the disciples stole his body. Um, it actually... Uh, goes kind of in tandem with uh, one other theory that we'll talk about here in a second, but um, there's a couple of reasons why that is not um, really a viable theory. Uh, one, and then another one would be the hallucination theory, because as you look at the number of people that Jesus appeared to after he rose from the dead, um, the explanation for that is everybody was hallucinating. Um, he did appear to five, over 500 people at one time, and there really has never been any documented mass hallucination of that kind of a scale. So it would have to be the only time in human history that that ever happened. Um, and so that one is also uh, kind of ridiculous, grasping at straws. The ghost theory is that Jesus didn't actually bodily resurrect, but that he came back as a ghost. That's fun. That's a fun theory. Um, <clears throat> so Jesus actually, uh, at least two different times, uh, ate food while he was around them and showed that, wow, um, it didn't fall to the floor. You know, like they, he didn't put it in his mouth and boom, it was on the floor. Um, and he did not ask them to call him Casper, though he was friendly. So um, the next one is the fraud theory, and that is essentially... Just that the whole entire thing was just one big fraud, all made up. Um, so basically all made up by all the people, but again, kind of similar to the theft story, kind of tying in with the theft story um, would be this fraud theory, that just everything about it was uh, fake and made up. And then the last one being the myth theory. Um, <laughs> the mythery. <laughs> it's kind of like a mystery, but it's a myth theory. Um, I'll be here all week. Okay, so um, the myth theory is basically that shortly after all of the events of approximately AD 30, uh, that people just started to make up the story that Jesus rose from the dead and that it then took hold and became fuel for people to create a church um, that could then have power over people by spiritually manipulating people and that kind of thing. So it's very... Um, diabolical in what they're trying to say is actually happening, taking the life of God, taking the, re the, the rescue from sin, and turning it into really this horrible, horrible, dastardly plot. Uh, it's, ugh. So, but again, there was, there was enough recording of Jesus uh, rising from the dead, people believing that he rose from the dead, Again, we'll talk about some evidences that the resurrection actually did happen um, that will kind of counteract these theories. That's why I'm not spending a lot of time debunking them as we go, because as you see when we investigate some of the evidences, uh, it will, you'll see how it kind of counteracts those, uh, those false theories of the resurrection. Are there reasonable evidences uh, to support believing in the resurrection? Uh, is it real and not just some crazy, crazy hoax? Um, so yeah, there are a few. Um, we're going to go through them very quickly, I promise, because there's a big concert or something happening at noon. <laughs> we're going to try to get out before noon, so nobody has to get stuck in that traffic. But um, Evidences for the resurrection, number one. There is. At the Fifth Avenue Park or something, there's... It's here in Lumberton. See, I know all the things that are going on. I'm very Nobody hip and cool. Else. I'm very hip and cool, all right? So there's a DJ. I don't know. It's crazy. But um, that is not what we're talking about right now. Everybody stay focused. So um, so one evidence for the for the resurrection is the fact that the tomb is empty. Yeah. Uh, it's, the, it's, it's a problem, guys. If you don't believe in the resurrection, you have to, you have to explain... Why in the world is the tomb empty? 
It's the number one uh, tourist attraction in the world that people go to to see something that's not there. Um, usually you go to see something that is there. It's very exciting. I, when we moved out here to Mississippi, we stopped at Yellowstone. I like to call it Jellystone, and I wish Yogi was there. But, uh, but Old Faithful, you know, the, the geyser that's been going off for, well, I don't know, a long time. And, well, it went off while we were there. It was great. I was like, man, this is crazy. This hole in the ground just shoots water out periodically. It's so weird. It's weird. But it was really cool, and we went and saw it. So, um, and we also saw uh, Mount Rushmore. That was cool. Um, and uh, the closest you get to going somewhere to see something that's not there would probably be the Grand Canyon, you know, because you're going to see, <laughs> you're going to see a big hole in the ground, you know, and it's like... Which, honestly, the Grand Canyon is almost a miracle practically to the size of the resurrection. Like, the fact that it happened. Um, yeah, like, so the empty tomb. What are you going to do with it? The tomb is empty. Um, we, we thought of, you know, the, the theft thing and the, you know, like, oh gosh, like, that's, that's why it's empty. So the Roman seal on the tomb is the number one reason why the whole theft idea kind of goes out the window. Because the Romans were very good at killing people. Okay? Yeah, they, were. they were very effective, efficient. Um, and that's why, that's why I even say like, it's kind of a miracle that Jesus made it to the cross. Because they knew, they knew how to punish people. And they, they really pulled out all the stops when it came to Jesus. <laughs> it was all really divinely orchestrated because... God was simultaneously solving the problem of sin, but also exposing the problem of sin, exposing the ugliness of sin. Like, if you can kind of picture the inside spirit man of you, or spirit woman, fine. Um, like, when you engage in sin, when you are locked up in sin, that your spirit person looks like what Jesus looked like on his way to the cross. That's what sin does to you. Sin leads to death. Your evil desires lead you into temptation. Temptation when it is, gives birth to sin. Sin when it is full grown gives birth to death. It's a, it's a life cycle that, that can't really be interrupted. It, it just happens. Sin leads to death. Sorry, that was a total rabbit trail, but, you know, it's yes, Easter, so... Rabbits? No, I'm just kidding. Okay, so... <laughs> so the Roman seal on the tomb said, um, what is in this tomb is staying in this tomb under penalty of death of everybody watching the tomb. And so they had high levels of motivation. Uh, if you at work, you know, you give somebody a task to do, um, and, and then you say, hey, if you don't if you don't perform this task, um, you know, if you get a milestone violation, uh, then we're going to penalize you with X, Y, Z penalties. Uh, most of the time in the professional world, the penalties are not very, you know, stringent. So a lot of times you get people that are like, whatever, I don't care. Do whatever you want. But these Roman soldiers were probably not feeling like that when it came to this measurement of their ability to get their job done. Their job was to make sure that that dead body stayed where it was. And really, they had a pretty easy job of it. Because there was a big, giant stone in the way that was going to take multiple people to move this thing. I mean, it wasn't like electronically. There was no um, valve and pulley system to um, open this thing with minimal effort. Like, this was just brute force that had to happen. And so, again... To go on top of the empty tomb problem is we also have the fact that that empty tomb had been sealed by the Roman seal. And then you had uh, the surprise guard. Like, this angel showed up, and he was like, whoa. You know, all of them, like, fell to the ground, and the stone was rolled away, and Jesus, you know, was alive again, and oh my gosh... Well, that story didn't go over very well to his authorities. And so they were like, well, here's the story that we want you to tell. Um, we want you to say something along the lines of, gosh, those darn disciples, they came and took the body. 
And so here's some money. That's the story you're gonna tell. Always follow the money, people. The money will always tell you where the problem is. But, uh, so the surprise guard, well, he's like, oh, whoa, ah, and uh, all of a sudden the body's gone, and oh, well, hey, at least he got paid. I mean, he didn't die, right? So um, the Roman government was like, yeah, uh, make some stuff up because we got to figure out. Um, so it's kind of weird. They paid people to say that the disciples stole the body, and yet they didn't go arrest the disciples. They did it so uh, their behavior didn't really line up with what they were saying. The missing body, um, nobody has ever been able to produce said body. Um, so, mm, you know, like the empty tomb, the Roman seal on the tomb, the surprise guard, the body still missing, even though you said they stole it. It seems like it would have been pretty easy to just get a search warrant and, you know, do, do a raid of the, of the property and, you know, find the said body, right? Because, okay, empty grave clothes. Um, so if they were going to steal the body, um, how many of you would unwrap it first? <laughs> Gross, okay? Like, first, just stealing a dead body in general, frowned upon, okay? Like, I'm pretty sure it's criminal in most states. Um, can't really say for all of them, but, like, um, disturbing a grave and, you know, robbing, you know, the bone, what a bad, bad idea, don't do it, punishable by, you know, the fullest extent of the law. Uh, but probably what you're not going to do if you're going to steal the body is to take the time, after you've exhausted yourself moving the giant stone, is to then unwrap the clothes and fold them up neatly before you leave. Okay, so, weird. But Mary trained Jesus really well. So when Jesus came back to life, he was like, hey, I got to make my bed. You know, I got to fold my clothes. And he took care of business. So let's pretend that none of those matter to you. Um, one thing that you definitely have to deal with on whether the resurrection is accurate, actually valid, is you have to look at the lives of the 12 disciples and you have to think to yourself, um, what happened to them? What, what, what went on in their lives that they went from scared, spitless, to willing to give their life for someone? What happened? Something significant had to happen, and uh, Charles Colson, or Chuck Colson, who was one of uh, President Nixon's uh, hatchet men, what they, what they called him, and spent a bunch of time in prison and uh, gave his life to Christ while he was in prison. And uh, really incredible testimony. He's since passed away, but uh, really incredible testimony where uh, he actually got, got saved, and then he ended up getting pardoned and got out of prison. So uh, I believe one of his books that he wrote is called Twice Freed. I think that's one of his books. Really incredible, and then ended up starting uh, Prisoners Fellowship International. So, uh, just a side note on the redemptive power of God. You take someone that is pretty much as corrupt as they come, right? That I mean, because we would all say there's some levels of uh, corruption going on in our government today, huh. and we would generally frown upon the people that are engaged in the corruption, and we'd be against that. Well, so Chuck Colson. He was part of that mess, right? He was actively engaged in government corruption. And yet, God not only saw fit to pursue him and save him, but then actually gave him the privilege of getting released from prison in the natural, so actually worked it out so that he could get out of prison for something he probably should have continued to serve time for. And then, beyond that see the lives of millions and millions and millions of people transformed by the power of the gospel because of, the, because of what happened to him. He went from a corrupt, self-centered, what's-in-it-for-me kind of guy to establishing a ministry that sees millions and millions of people come to Christ, the impact of which is outliving his own life. Because he met Jesus. Because he had an encounter with the living Son of God. Amen. 
Amen. That is what transformed his life. You have to actually throw Chuck Colson into the category of how do you explain that? Not just the 12 disciples, though that is a great question. Because they literally, like, well, let's read it, okay? We're going to read some of John chapter 20. Because you were like, is this guy going to read any of the Bible today? I'm not sure. I did start with a verse, okay? So, <laughs> John chapter 20, we'll start in verse 1. On the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early while it was still dark. She saw that the stone had been removed from the tomb. So she went running to Simon Peter and to the other disciples, the one Jesus loved, John, um, and said to them, they've taken the Lord out of the tomb. And we don't know where they put him. So that right now they're like, uh, they weren't expecting Jesus to be gone either. So they didn't seem like they were planning nothing. You know, they were, they were planning on taking care of the dead body. That was the extent of their plans. Like, oh, ye of little faith. I mean, he told them. <laughs> like, he, how many times have I done told you and I done told you? And all you were going to do was come and dress my dead body. So, uh, so they've taken him out of the tomb, and we don't know where they've put him. At that, Peter and the other disciple, I love how he never names himself, uh, went out. Heading for the tomb. The two were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter, humble brag, and got to the tomb first. Stooping down, he saw the linen cloths lying there, but he did not go in. Then, following him, Simon Peter also came, but he entered the tomb and saw the linen clothes, cloths lying there. The wrapping that had been on his head was not lying with the linen cloths, but was folded up in a separate place by itself. The other disciple who had reached the tomb first then also went in and saw and believed. So, so you can see like the beginning of the transformation for John right there in that moment is he saw the empty tomb and something started to click. For they did not yet understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples returned to the place where they were staying. So they saw the empty tomb, and then they went home. Okay. Like, what an exciting response. So it still wasn't quite enough to push them over the edge, right? But Mary stood outside the tomb crying. As she was crying, she stooped to look into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white sitting where Jesus' body had been lying, one at the head and the other at the feet. And they said to her, Woman, why are you crying? Because they've taken away my Lord, she told them. And I don't know where they put him. Having said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there. But she did not know it was Jesus. Maybe because it was still dark. I don't know. Uh, maybe, obviously, his uh, glorified body had to have been a little bit better than his human body because uh, his human body had been through a little bit, right? So, um, so it's like, thank God he didn't just come back in his regular human body. That would have been... The stuff of horror movies probably but um, but God's better than that and uh, we get to be resurrected not just into these bodies but into something far far better uh, Jesus said to her why are uh, woman Jesus said to her why are you crying who is it that you're seeking supposing that he was the gardener she replied sir if you have carried him away tell me where you put him and I will I will take him away Jesus said to her Mary and turning around she said to him in Aramaic, uh, Rabboni, which means teacher. Don't cling to me, Jesus told her, since I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and tell them that I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. And she told them what he had said to her. Another interesting evidence of the, of the whole resurrection story is both the first one that noticed anything was a woman, and then the first one that saw Jesus alive after the crucifixion was a woman. And if you were trying to concoct a story to make it the most believable, you definitely would not have done that. Because women were not allowed to testify in court, it would not have been a valid testimony. So there are a few things that happen in the Bible um, 
generally when you're just talking about the Gospels in general as eyewitness kinds of reports, is they often include kind of embarrassing statistics or stories about the people in the stories. That if you are trying to concoct a story to create a great religion to control people with, you probably wouldn't include those embarrassing details. You'd clean it up and you'd make it look all prim and proper. And you certainly wouldn't have a woman be your primary witness of the resurrection because you would want it to stand up in some sort of legal environment to say, no, Jesus is indeed alive. So the fact that God allowed women to be the first ones, I mean, that should say something. But Thomas, this is in verse 24, ooh, just kidding. Um, so, sorry, verse 19, when it was evening of that first day of the week, the disciples were gathered together with the doors locked because they feared the Jews. So this is the status of the disciples the day that Jesus rose from the dead. They were gathered together with the doors locked because they feared not the Romans. They were afraid of the Jews. Jesus came, stood among them, and said to them. So how did Jesus get into the locked room? Cool. Resurrection, resurrected, glorified bodies are awesome, apparently. So I got to give you one of those. Not, not right now. Like, I'll wait my turn. But man, that's pretty cool. So having said that, uh, let's see here. Mm -mm -mm. Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, peace be with you. Having said this, he showed them his hands and his side. So the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. So something is starting to happen. They went from fearful to rejoicing in a moment. And Jesus said to them, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. And that is a word for us today as well. As you have an encounter with the risen Christ, that Jesus would say, as the Father sent me, so I send you. And after saying this, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. Lord Jesus, I pray you would breathe on us today. I pray that we would receive God, the power of the Holy Spirit afresh in each of our lives today, God. For the work that you called us to, Lord, that we would be effective. Like the disciples saw the power of God in the areas where you released them to minister, God. In Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, even to the othermost parts of the earth. God, breathe on us today. Fill us with the power of your Holy Spirit. Amen. But Thomas, verse 24, but Thomas called a twin. One of the twelve was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples were telling him, hey, we've seen the Lord. And he said, he said to them, look, if, if I don't see the mark of the nails in his hands and put my finger into the mark of the, into the mark of the nails and put my hand into his side, I will never believe Like, come on, Thomas. Why are you being so difficult? A week later, his disciples were indoors again, and Thomas was with them. And again, the doors were locked. So something still, something still had not broken free for them. They were still locked up, still afraid of what was going on around them. And Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. And then he said, Thomas, put your finger here and look at my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Don't be faithless, but believe. Thomas responded to him, my Lord and my God. And it doesn't actually say that he actually had to touch. He, 
he saw Jesus and his testimony went from I will never believe to my Lord and my God. Because you've seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. We get to be a part of that. We get to be a part of that group that is blessed because we have not seen face to face and yet we believe. Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his, of his disciples that are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, that by believing you may have life in his name. The purpose of the gospel. So Chuck Colson says, because 12 men, uh, he goes, I, I believe that the resurrection is fact, and Watergate proved it to him. And it proved it to him because 12 men, the disciples, testified that they had seen Jesus raised from the dead, and they proclaimed that truth for 40 years, never once denying it. Every one of them was beaten, tortured, stoned, and put in prison, and all but one of them died as a martyr. They would not have endured it if it weren't true. The transformed lives of the disciples is a significant challenge to anybody that tries to say that Jesus did not rise from the dead. Watergate, on the other hand, embroiled 12 of the most powerful men in the whole world, and they couldn't keep a lie for three weeks. You're telling me 12 apostles could keep a lie for 40 years? Absolutely impossible. Okay. Well said, you know. The Christian church. Um, the Christian church is built not on Peter, but on the revelation that Jesus is the Messiah, that Jesus is the Son of God, crucified for our sins, raised from the dead, ascended into heaven, and coming back again. That's what the Christian church is built upon. And here we are, 2,000 plus years later, and it's still here. Now, does it have some ugly parts to its history? Yes. A lot of that. But is it also glorious and amazing in what the church has done and accomplished and multiplied all over the face of the earth? The Lord's Day, Sunday, the fact that people celebrate anything on Sunday actually is because that is the day that everybody says Jesus rose from the dead. So all of these people changed massive amounts of their religious beliefs. Because Jesus rose from the dead. We're talking people abandoning their family relationships and all kinds of stuff because they chose to believe in Jesus. The New Testament books. All of those books were written after Jesus died. And so why in the world, well, and almost all of them, well, all of them talk about either, either explicitly talk about the resurrection or are built on ideas and doctrines that rely upon the resurrection of Christ to be true. So, again, they didn't just give up their lives for the fact that Jesus rose from the dead, but they thought it so important that they wanted to put it down, record it, and allow other people to know what they were to believe. If the resurrection is false, then no response needed. Meeting adjourned. Literally. Like, let's go do something else. Whatever money, whatever money you give to the church, if, if you're a tither, you know, if you're 10%, or if you're you're a 15, 20, 30, whatever, you're just really generous, or or you're not quite to tithing, you're you're a you're a four percenter, because it's what you can do right now, whatever. Like, wherever you're at, let's just go take that money and go do something better. If Jesus did not rise from the dead, we're to be pitied above all men, and our faith is worthless, and we are still stuck in our sins. So let's go eat, drink, and be merry. For tomorrow we die. That is the hopeless reality of life without Christ. And sometimes you need to take yourself there and sit there in that moment and think about 
What does it mean to live without that hope? If the resurrection is true, on the other hand, this requires, requires a response. Accept or reject, surrender, or rebellion. Because if Jesus rose from the dead, he's the King of kings and the Lord of lords, the creator of heaven and earth, the boss of everything, to whom we owe everything. So the response is, get down on your knees and surrender and say, Lord, have your way in me. Be it unto me according to your word. That's the only response that makes sense. It's certainly the only response. I mean, repent, like turn from your wicked ways and respond to him. So now what? Today, like, the resurrection, I hope, I hope that you would firmly agree with me today that the resurrection did indeed happen and that none of those theories about how ooh, maybe it wasn't, maybe it wasn't really Jesus fully coming back to life, that those arguments are really pretty silly when you when you really analyze, the holes in those arguments are too significant. So hopefully you would agree with me today that the resurrection did indeed happen. Which means today we have a choice to make. One, if you don't yet know Jesus, I'd like to introduce you to him today. I'd like you to encounter Jesus. I'd like you to have that kind of a moment where Thomas said, I will never believe. And then he met Jesus and he said, my Lord and my God. I would like for you to have that kind of encounter with Jesus. If you've already met Jesus, I would like you to ask yourself that by looking at my own life, by looking at my own life, can I tell that Jesus is alive. And I think I think most of us are in the second category of people today. That we believe that Jesus died for our sins and we believe that the resurrection is true. And I really believe that that question is a Holy Spirit question for each of our individual hearts today. And then I think also collectively as a church. Can we tell that Jesus is alive by looking at the Lumberton Church? Can we tell that Jesus is alive by looking at how I live my life? And to whatever degree the answer is yes, praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. More Lord. But to whatever degree the, que the answer to that question may be no, is to then ask the Holy Spirit, breathe on me. Fill me with your power. Fill me with that fresh perspective. Break my heart for what breaks yours. God, may my priorities be your priorities. Or maybe the other way around. May your priorities become my priorities. You gotta say what you mean and mean what you say, you know, and so. So let's pray. Yeah. Father God, today, Lord, we come to you um, feeling, I come to you, Lord, today feeling challenged by that question. Can I tell that you are alive by looking at my life? And this is not a performance thing. This is not a, have I done enough good for you lately? But this is a, how much do my thoughts, how much do my actions, how much do my attitudes, my beliefs, and my behaviors, how much do they line up with my declared belief in the fact that you are a risen Savior? 
And Lord, we know that it is only by your grace that we accomplish any of this. So Lord, we just take a moment to sit before you, Lord, today and ask you to help us, to minister to us, Lord Jesus, and to help us, God, to have a resounding yes to that question in the future. God, that then in the next weeks and months, Lord, that the answer to that question, can I tell by looking at my life that Jesus is alive? By the, when the world looks at my life, can they tell that Jesus is alive? God, let the answer for each of us, Lord, be a resounding yes. God, we want to represent your resurrection power to the world around us. We want to see people's lives transformed by the power of the resurrection, God. We believe it's true, and we want to live according to that truth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.